nice if all of you are here, but it would be probably nice to be outside since it's one of the first beautiful days we've had um, in Baltimore for a long time. I guess I'll say a few things about this, this book, uh, Home Ground, but I would uh, urge you to take a look at it. It's, it's, do they have copies of it here? And it's a project that uh, the writer Barry Lopez uh, put together. He invited about 30 uh, contemporary American writers to work up definitions for uh, words that have to, have to do with landscape. And he gave each of us, I think, 20, I think it was 20 words, it was 20 or 25 words. I used to know all, all I used to know all the words that, that I had. Uh, pond is what I can remember. And um, which ones did you say? Do you remember? Did you have Everglades? I had Ever I did have Everglades. That was a that was a great one. Um, and we had to we had to write definitions, accurate definitions for each of the words. But then also to make it to make it interesting. And it was the hardest assignment I've ever had in my life. Uh, but also in some ways the one of the most interesting. And they came out to be like prose poems. Uh, and tried to figure out ways that you could quote, uh, the, uh, use the words, one, use the words that, uh, if they appeared in, in poems, that you, that you could find as well. So I'm not going to say much more about about it than that. There's a lot of fun. It's a very interesting book. Oh, there is one. There is one thing. I uh, was taken out by an NPR reporter. You can you can listen to this because it gives you a flavor of of the thing. Oh, one of my words was quagmire, and this reporter wanted wanted me to find a quagmire. So we found a quagmire off the uh, Washington Beltway, and we took a little tour into the into the marshy land. Uh, and it's online. You can just go to NPR and I think uh, type in uh, Barry Lopez Home Ground, maybe my name too, and it will come up and it's kind of fun. You'll see what we found in the choir room. Hearing the, uh, the hubbub up, up here uh, is good because the first poem I wanted to read um, has to do with baseball. And since this is the beginning of baseball season, Baltimore is such a great baseball town. I thought I would read this. It's called The Wave. And it has to do with an experience I had uh, in Memorial State, the last year of Memorial State. The Wave. Vendors with racks of soft drinks, pallets of cotton candy, ice cream in bright insulated bags, pretzels in metal cabinets, and the peanut man with his yellow peanut earring. Money folded between fingers, spokes of green waving in the glad pandemonium, greeting the bud man with his quick pouring mechanism strapped to his wrist like a prosthesis. Or the hot dog guy genuflecting in the steep aisles, anointing the roll and weaning with mustard before passing it down to the skinny kid sitting between fat parents. In the air above us, the flittering birds attracted and repelled by planetary field lights swoop in ecstatic barks, trapped under a dark, invisible dome. The park organ, the jumbotron, the mascot pacing atop the visitor's dugout, taunting them with oversized antics, while the groundskeepers miss the infield with the fire hose, leavening the calm, raked earth. Later in the fifth, or six, two soldiers sitting next to me who have paced each other with the beer and dinning and kept their buzz buffed with the flask take off their shirts though the night's cool and move to the front row where they face the crowd, sweep up their arms and command us to rise from our seats. At first, only a first respond, but like molecules quickening or cells dividing or herds stampeding, we coalesce. Orison provoking unison, section by section, as if township by township are standing up and sitting down becomes the Simon Says and Mother Naya of a nation, as it runs through our rippling, shimmering, upraised hands, 
that formed the crest of a wave built on the urges and urgings of the soldiers, whose skin is slick with sweat or some other labor, and whose bowl now, for all of us, for themselves, for the players on the field, is simply to stay in the wave, to keep it going for as long as they can.
<laughs> what idiot, blind, fearful, undumbed part of me assent to the third injection, I know well. For who can refrain from administering the shock or current, cinching the collar, or denouncing the illiberal rule laid down for the liberal cause? Who can concede to better judgment and be grateful for the stranger who leads you from the road and stays until the cops arrive? Or wave off the final swab of numbing gel that brought me to the brink again beneath Dr. Friendly's masked inscrutable face. This is like another um, mask poem. Just realize that because of the faces in it. It's called uh, Grandmother with Mink Stole, Sky Harbor Airport, Phoenix, Arizona, 1959. It rode on her shoulders, flayed in its purposes of warmth and glamour, its head like a small dog's, and its eyes more sympathetic than my mother's eyes' kindness, which was vast. Four paws for good luck, but also tiny sandbags of mortification and ballast, and in the black claws a hint of brooch or clasp. Secured like that, the head could law, and the teeth and the snout's fixed grin was the clenched, oh shit, of roadkill askew in the gutter. This she wore no matter the weather, and always, always when she stepped from the plane and paused at the top of the rolling stairs, she fit her hand to her brow against the glare of concrete and desert. Not a white glove soft salute but a visor that brought us into focus. Mother and father waving first, then oldest to youngest, dressed in our Easter best. We were prodded to greet her. She, who gripped the hot, gleaming rail, set her teeth in the mink's stiff grin, and walked through the smokeless mirage between us. She, who wore the pelt, the helmet of blue hair, and came to us mint and camphor scented, more strange than her unvisited world of trees and seasons, offering us two mouths, two sets of lips, two expressions, the large, averted one we were meant to kiss, and the other, small, pleading, that if we had the choice, we might choose. Cap 
calm like an eye is blind to everything but motion's pain. And this it sees so clearly, my father rarely moves, except to pee or shit or eat or sleep, and sometimes even these he can't negotiate. And yet the short up me is beautiful in its boundary state refusal to yield to the arthritic foot that's ready for its shoe. The great flowery dress of my seventh grade teacher, cotton or rayon, pillowcase for her vast mothering bosom, scented with the perfume of the unmarried, stretched over hips that made arms of the lamp I sat on. You were the handkerchief of my remorse just once. You, with your bright roses and tulips, spidery paths and vines and fluted leaves, all the smothering penance that nearly consoled me, until above my sobs I heard hers, and in her arms the crushing force or the grateful fury of our unburdening made that embrace a thing apart. Oh, heartsick woman, oh, bewildered boy. And then um, I'll, I'll read two more poems. This is called uh, Brendan's Hair. And we spent a long time hovering above the sky, crying on its great canvas surface, tears collecting in low spots, sagging the fabric through which the sun usually poured. That's why we went back inside and took up the brooms to push off the water and drain the burden our sadness made. That's why we walked up the aisle holding hands straight to his white coffin, a gift from the queen of cold and ice, and his white suit, the touch of snow, the bruised forehead, icy from the vault of death. And the white blanket folded under his gleaming hands, and why we didn't linger except to register the scalp albino pink and hair in its last furrows but wrongly hardened, which is what my son wanted to know in that instant of seeing his friend in the elaborate bed. He wanted to know, why did they do that to Brendan's hair? And then uh, the final poem is called An Individual History. This was the time, excuse me, this was before the time of lithium and Zoloft, before mood stabilizers and anxiolytics, and almost all the psychotropic drugs. But not before Thorazine, which the suicidal Lachlan called handcuffs for the mind. It was before, during, and after the time of atomic fallout, Auschwitz, the Nakba, DDT. And you could take water cures, find solace in quarantines, participate in shunnings, or stand at lures among the canes and crutches. It was in the march of time that taking off its boots, Fridays when families prayed the living rosary to neutralize communists with prayer, when electroshock was electrocution, and hammers recognized the purpose of the nail. And so if you were as crazy as my maternal grandmother was then, you might make the pilgrimage she did to the wards of state and private institutions and make of your own body a nail for pounding, its head sunk past quagmires, whose they are, and disappearances. And in this way, find a place in history among the detained and unparoled, an individual like her, though hidden by an epic of lean notation. Mark, Parkinsonian tremor, chronic, paranoid type, a time when the animal, slowed by its fate, was excited to catch a glimpse of its tail, or feel through her skin the dull overjoy when for a moment her hands were still. Thank you.